Hi folks, welcome back to this Electronics Explained Capacitors Part 3, where we're going to take a more holistic view of capacitors. We're going to look at frequency effects, but not only in the frequency domain, also in the time domain. And we're going to look at blocking capacitors and bypass capacitors right at the end as well. So we've spoken at length about how capacitors react to a step input, we call that. So if we have an input that looks like this, we know that the capacitor will charge up towards that input with kind of a, this kind of a shape. And hopefully that gives you some kind of idea that capacitors will react to different changes differently. Like what would happen if you put in a signal that looked like this? This is a sine wave, and what's interesting about sine waves is that the rate of the change of a sine wave is itself always changing. You can go into lots of maths and calculus and things to describe this, but we're not going to do any of that. We're going to just look at a simple case and just try and use our intuition that we've built up to make sense of these weird cases. So we know this as a low pass filter. If you haven't seen my Circuits 101 video, I spoke about this type of a circuit. You can look at it as a voltage divider with this resistance here being dependent on the frequency with this equation. You can kind of think of that as the resistance of this capacitor. This is a low pass filter. Low frequencies will be dropped more across the resistor than high frequencies because at low frequencies, this number is very big. The resistance of a capacitor drops off quite quickly and it kind of looks like this. But let's forget about all that now. So let's talk about it in terms of changing voltages. Kind of just how we looked at that step voltage and how it worked. Just then we were talking about how the RC time constant affects how this will charge up. And if we kind of think of the capacitance value as always being the same, then that kind of makes sense because we remember that the current through the capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the rate of change of the voltage. And so we saw that more current caused the voltage to change more quickly. And so we know less resistance gives us more current. So the smaller this is, the quicker this will charge up, and also the smaller the R times C will be. Because as this resistance value falls, the value of C times this smaller value also falls. Let's not worry about values and things. What happens when we feed in one of those sine waves where the period of the sine wave, which is just a fancy way of saying how long does it take it to go up and down and back? So this is zero volts. The period, the length of this sine wave is long compared to this RC time constant thing. Let's forget about the capacitance value for now. This is whatever. And let's just imagine we've got a nice large resistance, which means we're getting not much current, which means we're getting a slow changing voltage across the capacitor. But this is even slower than that. Without getting too much into it, what that means is that basically as this is changing, because this is changing nice and slowly, the capacitor has plenty of time to try and catch up. What's essentially going to happen is as we apply an input signal, this is a positive signal, then we know there's going to be current, it's going to flow this way, and that's going to charge this capacitor up. And so because this is nice and slow, the capacitor has plenty of time to charge up. It can't quite keep up. And so now we see here, this has started to come back down. But it's still higher than the capacitor. The capacitor is going to carry on charging until it hits that voltage. And so now these two voltages are the same, the current flow stops for, for an instant. We're not concerned with that, because now the input voltage is lower than the voltage on the capacitor. Let's just put a random value on here. Let's say at this point, this is 9 volts, and this was 10 volts up at the top, and minus 10 volts here. So now this is going to go down towards 0 volts, and as that happens, the capacitor is going to start to discharge this way. So now, as this goes down, the capacitor is going to discharge and kind of follow it down. As it slows down, this is going to slow down, and then this is actually going to start going back up towards ground from minus 10 volts, and they're going to meet again. And that's just going to carry on happening over and over and over and over. So we can see how there's a very small phase shift and the output looks a lot like the input. Here's a picture of it happening in real life. There's a very small phase shift and the output looks like the input. That's just the action of a low pass filter. So what happens if we then speed this frequency up so it's much faster than the RC? Again, you'll have to forgive my terrible drawing, but what's going to happen now is that the capacitor can't it's nowhere near being able to keep up with this, but it's going to try, it's going to do its best. But this happens, and then these have met, and it's going to discharge. Go like this, let's say. 
and then they've met again, so it's going to charge back up again. And, you know, if it was a better drawing, again, here's a scope shot of it looking legit. But you can see now how, A, the output is much smaller than the input, and there's a massive phase shift. You know, the output doesn't line up with the input. They're the same frequency, but the output no longer lines up with the, with the input. And that's why you've seen me write this instead of this, which is the complex form of that, which takes into account the phase shift, because we don't care about this. We don't care about the phase shift in these types of filters because the only signals that get phase shifted are the signals that we're getting rid of. I don't care if the high frequencies that are filtered out by this low pass filter are also phase shifted to bits because we're filtering them out. Who cares what happens to them? That's the beauty of this. It's, it's very convenient for us who don't want to do all these complex things. We, we just want to worry about the nice frequencies that aren't phase shifted. And I'll talk more about phase shift in a second, but I'm just, I just wanted to show you there why we don't have to worry about phase shift as much as you think we do. Because phase shift are kind of scary, all phasor diagrams and degrees and radians, and let's not worry about it for now. And it's the same the other way around, of course. If we take the high pass version, let me just show you that. So now we'll start with that quicker one. We've got this slow RC time constant, so the voltage across the capacitor can't change quickly enough. But in this case, with the high pass filter, the voltage across the capacitor opposes the input because of how we've set it up. So because it can't charge up quickly, it can't oppose the input. So it allows those quick changes to pass through it. And then we see those at the output. And if we had a nice slow input like we had before, where the capacitor had plenty of time to charge up, then this is what that looks like. And we see that we've got a very small output because the capacitor is able to charge up and mostly oppose the input. So the difference across the capacitor is nearly the same as the input voltage. And so that fact that capacitors want to charge up to the difference between the input and the output lead us to how we use capacitors a lot in circuits, which is as a blocking capacitor. So if I have two systems here, one of them, say I've got some op amps over here at 15 volts, and I've got some logic stuff over here at 3.3 volts. I want to connect these two systems together so that one can talk to the other. How do we do that? Well, if we do that with a resistor, then we're going to have 15 volts minus 3.3 volts difference across this. So we're going to have an 11.7 volt drop across this resistor, which is going to give us some current here. There's loads of reasons why we might not want this to happen. So what can we do? Well, what we can do is instead of a resistor here, we can stick a lovely capacitor. Let's say we just turn this on. What's the voltage at this point going to look like? Well, it's going to start at zero. And then when we turn the system on, that's going to jump up to 15 volts. And over here, this starts at zero. And when we turn the system on, that's going to jump up to 3.3 volts. So what does this capacitor see? An 11.7 volts jump across it. And what does this look like? Well, we know what's going to happen now. This is going to charge up to approximately this voltage in five time constants, let's say, we'll get almost there. And then it's just going to chill there at 11.7 volts across this capacitor and almost no current. There's going to be a little bit of leakage current, you know, but a negligible current. And also the beauty of this is that once we're in this steady state, we call this, like all the way over here when this is charged up, this will block DC. But if this is, say, an amplifier, this the output sits at 15 volts, and then, so this was our output, so at some point we switched it on and it jumped up to 15 volts and then it sat there for a while, and then it amplified something and did this, and then goes back to 15 volts. Well, this side, so we'll see at some point we switched the system on and it jumped up to 3.3 volts on this side, and then it sat there, and then these frequencies, because they're high frequency compared to DC, you know, you'd select this capacitor with a value that would allow the frequencies that you're interested in to pass, then you'll see these over this side, and then that'll just return to that value. And this, so this is what you see over here, and this is what you see over here, that is incredibly, incredibly useful. And on top of that, you can also use this to get rid of noise that you don't want, and that's called a bypass capacitor. And we see these all the time as well. So if you have some sort of chip and you put a capacitor across here, so across the power supply, then any weird rumblings and tumblings on your power supply, like say this, power, this chip 
is doing whatever, and then it takes a gulp of current, that's going to put noise on the power supply. And if you've got tons of chips all doing this all the time, your chips will not like it. If they, if they want five volts, like they want five volts that looks like this, they don't want five volts that's like with all noise all over it. And so these capacitors, all the noise sits across these capacitors. So if you're thinking of it in the frequency domain, all the noise goes across the capacitor because they look like a short circuit to noise and they look like an open circuit to DC. Or you can think of it in the time domain where these capacitors charge up. So, you know, the system powers on and they charge up. This chip takes a gulp of current. That charge comes from the capacitor instead of coming from the power supply. And so instead of loading down the power supply, you load down this capacitor. And the capacitor, we don't care what happens to this capacitor. That's what it's there for. Okay, so thanks for watching, folks. Let me know down below if you want to know any more about capacitors. I think I've covered pretty much all the basics. And come back next time for the next part of this series where we're going to be talking about diodes. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, do all that stuff. Ring the bell. Find me on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, watch more of my videos here, some over here. And I'll see you all next time. Take care.